everyone who's enjoyed the sessions today. We started the day talking about how can we build a mass socialist feminist movement to end oppression. We talk about what, I, what the ideas of Marxism have to offer us in the 2020s. We talk about how can Palestinian liberation be won, the struggle against racism, and about how can we win the fight to end capitalism. I'm sure you've all seen the posters behind me all across Liverpool uh, saying that the working class is back. Um, and of course, the working class hadn't gone anywhere. Um, <laughs> we were always here, but we weren't organized. Um, and over the last few years, we've seen the working class starting to be emerge, uh, taking strike action with higher numbers of uni unionization, uh, increasing their confidence and starting to have more of a class consciousness um, around what are the interests uh, that unite us. And of course, you know, this might be in a very incipient stage, but it's the direction that it's traveling in. Uh, and what could this mean in the future? As capitalism spirals further into crisis, workers and young people um, are fighting back. The brutal impact of an unprecedented cost of living crisis, skyrocketing inflation, uh, and st stagnating wages mean that households are facing the biggest heat to their incomes since records uh, become. At the same time, we're experiencing the largest strike wave in Britain for over 30 years as workers become increasingly militant and com combative. Over a million people went out on strike last year to fight for a pay rise and against the grinding down of our public services. This means a massive shift in the consciousness and confidence of working class people. Workers and young people are saying they've had enough and they're going to fight for what they deserve. And contrary to what they sold us in the mainstream media, the majority of ordinary working class people are in support of the strikes. This was even more the case when uh, nurses went on a historic strike, the first one since 1988. There are real victories uh, that the strikes have won, but there have been challenges too. And one of them, of course, um, it's been the bureaucracy within the trade unions. Many of the disputes haven't managed to win above infl inflation pay rises. And we need to ask ourselves why that is. The question of leadership and the strategy comes up. We need fighting bank and file led trade unions that are willing to do whatever it takes to win. And the strike wave has not been a development just in Britain, it's been a global phenomenon. And this is why tonight we have this excellent lineup of international speakers so we can hear firsthand about what's happening in the US and China and Ireland and more, and the potential the international struggle has. Internationally, we're living in an age of disorder. A global pandemic which led to the deaths of millions of people, the war in Ukraine, the horrors in Gaza where thousands of people have been massacred by the Israeli state, climate catastrophe threatens the future of the planet, but globally we're seeing uprisings on, issues after, on issue after issue. From the massive feminist revolt in Iran, the drone strike in Israel Palestine, huge protests against Macron in France, and hundreds of thousands of people, if not millions, marching across the world in solidarity with the people in Gaza. We can say confidently then that the working class is back and it's on the march. So our first speaker um, is going to be really important one. <laughs> Sam Swan is a member of Socialist Alternative in the United States and is the first elected socialist in Seattle in nearly a century. After having won four consecutive elections, Shams office will leave office undefeated at the end of this year, despite the efforts by the right wing and billionaires, including Joe Bezos, who spent millions trying to defeat her and didn't manage to do so. Socialist Alternative and Shama have launched Workers Strike Back, a nationwide movement to fight along with workers uh, organizing for living wages, unions, Medicare for all, and against oppression. Um, Socialist Alternative and Shama have used her elected office uh, to uh, help lead the movement that won the $15 uh, per hour minimum wage in 2014 and the historic Amazon tax in 2020. And just this past Tuesday, alongside community activists and working people, Shama introduced a city council resolution calling for an immediate ceasefire in Gaza 
and then and an end to US military funding to Israel and an end to Israeli state occupation. So I'm not going to expand anymore. So please give the warmest uh, welcome uh, to Shams. taken strike action in the United States in over 300 strikes this year. This compares with only 36,600 over the same period two years ago. This summer, this past summer this year has been called the summer of strikes in the United States. As Sarah correctly said, this is incipient, but it is already such a stark contrast from the feeling of dejection and demoralization that pervaded the labor movement only a short while ago. COLA is a big theme in the strikes. COLA, meaning cost of living adjustment, is a running theme in these strike actions as workers understand that the billionaire class actually got richer during the pandemic at a time when workers were, were called essential and were called on to make sacrifices, but then have got further fleeced by these rich people. And so it is in this context that the United Auto Workers won, the United Auto Workers Union won historic victories through their strike action at General Motors, Ford, and Stellantis, or the big three. Most importantly, I mean, they won many victories that I don't have time to cover, but most importantly, the union prioritized raising the pay of the lowest paid workers, which is a huge step in ending the viciously divisive system of tears, which caused different workers to be paid dramatically different wages for doing exactly the same work side by side on the production line. The most important unionizing drive in the nation is at an Amazon facility called KCBG. This is Amazon's largest air hub in the world, located in northern Kentucky. Socialist Alternative is working alongside rank and file workers there, along with the help of workers strike back, which I'll talk about more. Uh, the workers are leading the union drive, fighting for a $30 an hour starting wage, 180 hours paid time off, and union representation and disciplinary meetings to fight against retaliation and favoritism, which is rampant at Amazon. Amazon executives and their billionaire shareholders know that if workers get organized, they can, uh, they can win these demands, so management is doing everything they can to stop the union drive and we are fighting alongside the workers against Amazon's union busting. The ideas that we are bringing forward alongside the KCBG workers are broadly what we would call class struggle unionism, which is rejecting what has primarily dominated in the United States and also globally, really, for decades, which is business unionism, and which led to a historic decline in the union movement in the US, workers being sold out living standards plummeting, especially with the um, dramatic betrayals during the Great Recession when the labor leadership absolutely failed to build any kind of fight back. Business unionism, as some of you might already know, is the idea that workers should quietly lead labor leaders, negotiate mutually agreeable contracts with the bosses in reality, which are filled with defeat for workers, rather than the workers actively organizing themselves. One of the hallmarks of business unionism is preventing strikes at all costs in exchange for a quote-unquote seat at the table to negotiate. Business unionists put their stress on the bargaining process, not on organizing workers on the streets and in the workplaces. They fear antagonizing management by any real mobilization of workers, much less going on strike, but even now what you can see is that if they do, if they are forced to agree to a strike because of just, you know, just in order to be letting off steam of, of angry workers, they don't want to use the strike as a serious avenue to shutting down the profit machine of the bosses to wrest the most far-reaching concessions possible, setting the stage for even bigger victories in the future. They don't want to do that and, that, and class struggle opposite, uh, or unionism is the opposite of that. So in other words, class struggle opposition is an example of what socialists and, uh, and we as Marxists would call fighting strategy. 
Socialist Alternative and I have used such a fighting strategy in our council office in Seattle as well. Sarah mentioned some of the historic victories we have won, the $15 an hour minimum wage, the Amazon tax to fund social housing. We also won a city council resolution replacing Seattle's Columbus Day with Indigenous Peoples Day. That actually required our Marxists to win, believe it or not. The indigenous people were trying for decades to do that, but the Democrats were not having it. We also won the nation's first resolution condemning the anti-Muslim and anti-poor citizenship laws attempted by India's right-wing Prime Minister Narendra Modi and his Hindu fundamentalist Bharatiya Janata Party. In February this year, we defeated the Modi-aligned Hindu right-wing in the United States and Democratic Party opposition to make Seattle the first ever jurisdiction outside South Asia to bring a ban on caste-based discrimination. Last year, we won a, a legislation that made Seattle the nation's abortion, the first abortion sanctuary. We talked about that this morning. We have won these victories despite the consistent opposition of the Democratic Party, which dominates Seattle, and of the billionaire class they serve. A fighting strategy for an elected office means not being a career politician. Social Sultanas elected representatives are accountable to our membership and to the working class as a whole and have an obligation to use their elected office to fight for working and oppressed people. We're also different in that I take home only the average worker's wage and donate the rest of my six-figure salary after taxes to union strike actions and social justice movements. This is not a question of charity. This is a question of politically remaining accountable to the interests of the working class. Yeah. Throughout our decade in City Hall, we have kept in mind that the other council members, the Democrats on the council, are not my friends or colleagues. It's not like a normal workplace where absolutely we, it's our, you know, we, we should be building solidarity amongst our fellow workers because we have shared interests to build collective fight back. But that is not the definition you would use for elected office. When you're in elected office, you are there to represent workers, not manage the affairs of the capitalist state. And so by that measure, you are absolutely on the opposite side as most elected officials, and that is the way it would go. So they are not our friends or colleagues and that my real colleagues are the working people in our movements. We do not seek to build common ground with the representatives of the political establishment and big business. We base ourselves on the working class, and in doing so, we expect, we have always expected, the relentless opposition of Seattle's Democratic Party, and I can tell you, they have not disappointed us in that. I would have been completely incapable of fighting for working people and the oppressed if I had based myself on relationships with the democratic politicians and made backroom deals with them in order to avoid conflict. All of this is virtually unheard of, unfortunately, for working people, and so it is important that we hold up this concrete example and show that it can be done, but this is how you do it. You use class struggle methods and you use a fighting strategy. Uh, and uh, as we leave office, uh, uh, now we are, you know, we have launched Worker Strike Back, and I'm going to talk about that, but I just wanted to mention something that Sarah already said, that even though we have barely a month left in office, that doesn't mean that we take it easy and we stop fighting, and that is why just this past Tuesday, just, just days ago, we brought this resolution condemning the Israeli state's war on Gaza, calling for an end to U.S. funding to the Israeli state's war machine, and uh, uh, calling for an end to the occupation. And in launching Worker Strike Back, this nationwide movement, we are applying the same ideas that we have used in our decade in Seattle to help organize workers. Our demands, Worker Strike Back's demands are, workers need a real race, good union job for all, fighting racism, sexism, and all oppressions such as transphobia, and quality affordable housing and free healthcare for all, but in order to accomplish any of this, that we are not going to accept any more sellouts and that we need a new party. Since launching in March of this year, Worker Strike Back has established active chapters that span the country from Seattle to Boston, from Madison to Houston. Worker Strike Back is also building regular meetings to discuss what strategies are needed to win real gains for working people. In Houston, Texas, for example, it's a conservative, you know, Republican-led state, so this is important. Worker Strike Back is 
organizing with unionized educators and standing against attempts to privatize and shut down public schools. In Madison, Wisconsin, graduate students are working with workers' strike back and building a rank and file fight back against vicious union busting laws in another um, you know, state that has had Republican and very anti worker rule. We have also created our weekly broadcast on strike that covers issues from the perspective of workers' needs, not billionaire greed and provides an analysis and strategy to build working class movements. You're going to hear from Tom Barker this evening. We feature Tom Barker's struggle at, uh, his, uh, at the school that he works at in Leicester. And we talked about how the workers are winning these victories. And so I really urge you all, before you leave, to take this uh, leaflet with you that has a QR code. Please subscribe to this show. Watch, we have, 10, we have done 10 episodes so far. Uh, including one on Israel-Palestine. Our upcoming one is also going to be on Israel-Palestine. We, we, need, we need your support in terms of donations and also in terms of subscribing to the YouTube channel. And please post comments on the YouTube channel of what you like in the show and what feedback you have. All of this is very important because this is not journalism. This is an active part of the work of Worker Strike Back where we are. This show is not just simply talking about struggles, but it's providing a real analysis of how workers can win and what strategy is needed. Now, Worker Strike Back is holding our first national membership drive to ask the thousands of people who support us across the country, and the response has been tremendous, to join Worker Strike Back as members and get involved. I want to conclude on the last demand of Worker Strike Back, which is for a new party. And I think it's really useful to illustrate this using the Israel-Palestine issue. Because what we're seeing, right, you know, and this is remarkable, this is in the belly of the you know, US capitalism, US imperialism, which is the backbone of the Israeli state's war against Gaza, where we have 80% of Democratic Party voters and a vast majority of people as a whole in favor of ceasefire. And, and, in, and yet, what happened in Seattle this past Tuesday is that the Democrats in Seattle, who may be local, but they are part of the democratic machinery, which is at this moment the representative of the interests of US imperialism, did not even agree to bring our resolution for a vote. They refused to allow this to be brought for a vote. What, the working people who were there were absolutely infuriated. They, you know, they, they shut down the meeting really by, yeah, by saying that shame on you Democrats, we need to kick you out, that sort of thing. And the, the, the ruckus was so large, so loud, that the council president was forced to shut down the meeting and call for a 10 minute recess, which prompted one of the sort of local left wing newspapers to say that these Democrats are refusing to even vote on a resolution that is calling for a ceasefire, but for themselves they call for a humanitarian pause. <laughs> We are going to be bringing back this resolution for a vote on the 21st because uh, working people are angry and it's not just Palestinians, it includes Jewish and many other people including union members who are aghast that this happened and they want to continue the fight back. Nationally we are saying, seeing the same phenomenon. Biden's support among Amer Arab Americans was 59% in 2020, today it is at 17%. And Palestinians across the nation have been chanting in November, and it's not just Palestinians, you know, broadly Muslim Americans and Arab Americans have been chanting in November, we remember, they're talking about November next year, which is going to be the election, presidential election uh, uh, at this moment between Biden and Trump. Uh, and there another slogan is no ceasefire, no vote. This is, this is all a recognition among a broad mass of people, millions of people, that imperialism and warmongering in the United States is a bipartisan agenda of both the Democrats and Republicans. But this immediately poses a concrete question. If that's the case, then what is the alternative to Biden and the Democrats? Certainly not Trump and the Republicans, because they are both warmongers. So it raises the question of a new party, which is, you know, on the one hand, it's linked to winning basic needs like health care, the living standards, the cost of living adjustments, taxing big business to fund our needs, uh, canceling the trillion dollars of student debt, all of that, and winning uh, and, and building the mass movements for winning these reforms. But it also raises the question of imperialism, and, and it's an internationalist 
question. Because at the end of the day, for a Middle East and for a world free of war and imperialism, this cannot be ended on the basis of capitalism. In fact, right now, there is a threat of wider wars in the context of the new Cold War between the US-led bloc and the China-Russia-led bloc. This is a very dangerous situation. So I would say that it actually uh, is, is, a, is a really important opportunity and it's our obligation as socialists or people who are here who are socialists, socialism sympathizers and who, may, who might join socialist alternative, that we raise this question of why working people need a party of our own, a party of working class, a party that is anti-imperialist, anti-capitalist and provides a real strategy for fighting against warmongering, against imperialism and against oppression and economic exploitation.
you want to take a look around you. Right now, I'm worried about the lack of future offered to younger capitalism. You're told to man up, be a breadwinner, whilst um, all the jobs are around you are minimum wage zero or contracts. <coughs> so what does Andrew Tate say? Just work harder and you'll be successful. You'll have a big house and a nice car. Um, where have you heard that before? It's hardly revolutionary. So how can we push back against the growth of the right? For a start, we won't defeat the growth by uh, the growth of the right with liberal moralistic appeals like Let Love Win. We also can't sit and wait for lesser evilism voting at elections. Figures like Keir Starmer, though they haven't embraced the same rhetoric of the right to, well, to the same extent as Sunak's stories, still don't have the tools at their disposal that can actually prevent the growth of the far right. The lukewarm policies they propose, like not even committing uh, to the union's cause for a £15 minimum wage, do nothing to improve the conditions of poverty, deprivation and hopelessness that is currently fueling the bend towards the far right. Um, and whilst we're witnessing multiple overlapping failures and crises of capitalism, the right is spinning in a frenzy to obscure who and what is really responsible, instead ramping up culture wars and dividing all narratives like the recent rise in xenophobia, uh, xenophobia, Islamophobia and attacks on trans people. However, from Liverpool to Glasgow to Dublin to Belfast to Cardiff and to Edinburgh, working class people have pushed back against the division of the right by showing up the counter protests when the right is trying to spread their bile, or by using trade union organising to refuse to allow transphobic groups to meet in their workplaces. One part of our duty, of course, is going to counter protests to publicly embarrass and weaken the resolve of right wing groups and figures, and they have so far been outnumbered time and time again. But that's only one aspect of our fight. So in Limerick, in Ireland, members of ISA assisted library workers in resisting a planned far-right stampede in their libraries. The far-right group had aimed to take LGBTQ plus books off the shelves. So workers, socialists and trade unionists linked arms at the doors of the library, blocking the group from being able to enter, and the police did nothing. In fact, in a previous clash, the police actually escorted the far-right groups into the library in the face of counter-protesters. Now compare that to how they treat people at picket lines or at the recent uh, Gaza Solidarity protests. The workers in the Limerick libraries have now set up a network to ensure that uh, future attempts at intim intimidation and attacks are shut down in a similar way. And such actions and networks need to only be the start of socialists and the unions coming together to offer a programme and a vehicle that can actually improve the lives of working class people to bring people from a multitude of different backgrounds together to explode, expose the lack of alternative offered by the right, to fight for housing for all, to tie the question of trans rights to the need for gender reform and healthcare within a fully funded NHS. And such campaigns can bring working class, to people, working class people together to fight for these demands, but also to talk through the issues that currently divide us. And that is in a pipe dream. Just to give two examples, uh, in my town at the start of the year, after a paramilitary shooting was, was carried out, workers came together in protest and in discussion to talk about how we can resist that slide into conflict um, and violence of the past. Similarly, over the summer, um, in the face of a barrage of transphobic rhetoric in, in the media, uh, socialist alternative members proposed a motion to uh, unite the union's conference, which called, demanded that the union take a a stronger stand on actually fighting transphobia. Um, and in a room of hundreds of workers' reps, about 700, 800 workers' reps, and after a very um, sensitive and political discussion, that, was, that motion was passed unanimously, despite what the media will tell you about working class people's opinions on trans people. So it's through such struggles that we can actually fight the hopelessness of a capitalist future and fight for a socialist society democratically run by and for workers that can provide for all, not just the women with the billionaire bank accounts. Okay. So, we only have one speaker left. Uh, <laughs> I've been losing this. Um, yes, yeah, so Doug Barker is going to be our next speaker. He's uh, it's not just a member of socialism, but even less than well, he's also a teaching assistant and a unison steward. Um, he's going to be speaking about the situation in education and, in particular, about the heroic 43 day dispute at Ashfield Academy 
Um, and I believe he's got um, a very juicy and important announcement um, for us about it. Um, so I won't reveal anything and I'll just bring Tom in. Please give him a, a big, big um. The introduction, Sarah. Um, so yeah, as Sarah said, I'm a Unison steward um, and a teaching assistant at a special needs school in Leicester. It's Ashfield Academy is the name of the school. And I know many people in here um, have been following the dispute and I thank you for your support. And I also have to say that we have an update. After 43 days of strikes over a seven month period, I am very pleased to announce for the first time that the Ashfield strikers have won. by next week. I, I know I can trust everybody in here not to go and tell the news or write your own press releases or anything about it. Um, but but we, are, we are going through that process um, and I, I'm extremely confident that members are going to accept the offer. I know that because members are celebrating at the moment. For the lowest paid in my workplace who've been in post for five years, um, these are unqualified TA, TA so people um, without um, GCSEs in Maths and English. The settlement for 2022-2023, when it's combined with the, the government offer which was implemented, amounts to around 20% pay rise for these workers. For teaching assistants who are new to the job, the combined settlement is 15%, and the settlement for the remainder of classroom-based staff sits somewhere between these two figures. So this is uh, a dispute that was run in the main by teaching assistants, and all of these people have won above inflation pay rises. Uh, we were also able to force our employer to backdate these um, pay rises to 2022, Originally, they only proposed to implement them in 2023, um, so members are going to receive a large sum of money in back pay. Um, and in addition to this, the, we've forced our employer to pay a £2,000 unconsolidated um, offer for every member of support staff at the school. So, I mean, one obvious question is why so high? Um, why, why have we won so much? Um, and the part of the answer for that is that the workers and the members have been absolutely determined um, to not be faced with yet another pay cut. Um, but part of it also reflects how badly we were underpaid previously. Um, I work at an academy uh, where they're not obligated to follow the National Joint Council um, paying conditions, and so we were paid less than the rate for the job. The flip side of this is that these figures are also affordable to our employer because they've saved a lot of money by underpaying us for the last 10 years. But in any case, this, this, these figures are really massive. At a time when um, the majority of workers across the country, even those in dispute, are facing deteriorating paying conditions, members in my workplace will stand out as a group of workers who have significantly improved their situation. I think the main lesson from this dispute, and this is going to be something that we can discuss at length into the future, um, is that workers will fight tooth and nail for improvements if they're given something worth fighting for, first of all, along with a strategy which they can see has a chance of winning. And it also shows what's possible when a clear lead is given. Um, and I think an another important lesson from it is that you shouldn't settle for the first offer, but that you can push on and win more. Well, it's at Ashfield Academy, overwhelmingly women, and from diverse backgrounds, I'm not the best representative of them at all. And I did try to convince many of them to come. Um, but given how recently we got the, the result, um, it's very difficult. People uh, have family commitments and various other things. Um, but quite a few of them have made a commitment to go into um, the women's conference 
um, in unison and I'm sure that they also come to our meetings when they're given a bit more time and a bit more notice. Um, the support staff at Asheville do work that under capitalism is typically seen as women's work, so care, that, um, care and education, that sort of stuff. Um, the dispute um, clearly bears out part of our perspectives that women workers will be to the fore in industrial struggle. Um, this dispute was eagerly taken up by those from the workplace who I think saw it as an opportunity to push back against the years of exploitation and underappreciation they have for doing what is typically called unskilled work, but which in reality is highly skilled work, but it's just very undervalued in society. The dispute, um, I think, has implications for the possibility of struggle um, in the care sector nationally, which remains woefully unorganised. And the dispute um, also shows, I think, what is simmering beneath the surface in schools across the country right now. And although workers have, in um, support workers, schools have not managed to reach the threshold um, for strikes when they've voted, they have voted overwhelmingly for strikes. And I think that once they get past that threshold, we're going to see this happening at lots of schools across the country. The, the experience of the pandemic um, has been a big factor in all of this as well. Um, there's now a wider consciousness of who does the important work in society and that these people are very often the ones who are the worst off. Um, this of course also extends beyond my workplace as well. Um, this has been the experience of those who work in the NHS, in supermarkets, in transport, in factories and the list goes on. This, the dispute also took place against the backdrop of um, deteriorating paying conditions over the last 15 years. Um, but also the sharp acceleration of this process with the cost of living crisis, which has hit all working um, class people extremely hard. The need to fight for improvements has never been more urgent. It's extremely unlikely that this dispute would have been possible without the historic strike wave which swept, swept the country this year and last. The fact that NHS workers took action gave confidence to others in similar roles, like us, that not only was it possible to fight, but that it was morally just, and I think we need to draw out the lessons from this dispute because we are living in, in historic times. We've just seen a huge strike wave across multiple sectors. The ruling class attempted to hold down wages and the working class fought back. This wave of struggle has now slowed down. This does not reflect a softening of the mood, but rather the weakness of the existing trade union leaders. Rank and file union members are increasingly seeing the need to get better organised not only in the fight against employers, but critically also often against the leadership of their own unions. Health workers have been at the forefront of this struggle over the last year. They were offered a real terms pay cut on this year's pay offer, probably worth 6% plus a lump sum. The leaders of these unions recommended their members accept this offer. There was a huge pushback in the Royal College of Nursing where members rejected the offer, overturning the recommendation of the leadership. Members organised in NHS Workers Say No, a rank and file activist group that I'm sure a lot of us are familiar with, are coordinating the fight back, both against the government but also in challenging their own union leaders. This group has the potential to develop into a very powerful broad left within the union. In education, the government was originally offering teachers a 2 to 3% pay rise, but fearing a cross-union coordinated strike, coordinated strike in September, the government improved its offer to 6.5%. <coughs> Although the real terms pay cut, again the leadership of the NEU recommended this offer to its members. Like in the NHS, this recommendation sparked mass anger from below. A thousand NEU members, some of them are comrades, Socialist Alternative has doubled our representation on the National Executive Committee of the NEU, which I think shows um, what is possible um, through these um, disputes. In other areas, establishment trade union leaders, fearful of mounting anger from below and a growing challenge from the left, have been forced to take more combative positions. This is the case in local government, um, where Unison, my union, uh, rejected a real terms pay cut outright and moved straight to an industrial action ballot. Like I said, the overwhelming majority of members voted for strikes, but the union did not reach the threshold in all but a, a very few um, areas. Um, it was notable that the areas where um, they got the best results in there were in places 
where we have comrades and often places, um, yeah, often places where we have comrades or where the left is in a strong position. And within Unison, um, as part of this process, we, a socialist alternative um, recently went from three to five members on the National Executive Council of Unison. So our influence and strength within the unions are growing. We were also just 150 um, votes short of getting a sixth member, me, um, elected. But um, yeah, but I'll try again at uh, the time, maybe. Um, and who was that? Uh, me. It was me. Oh, I said me. <laughs> um, yeah, so the, lo the longest running disputes are in the most militant unions in rail and postal services. When these disputes first started, the leaders of the, both of these unions enjoyed a kind of like uh, celebrity status. Mick Lynch from the railway union became a symbol of struggle. A rally in London, um, 10,000 postal workers were lovingly chanting the name of the General Secretary, um, Dave Ward. Today, the reputations of these leaders have been tarnished. Workers are realising that we need more determined leadership, even in the most militant unions. While there have not been any major victories for national disputes, um, there have been countless localised victories. A common theme in many of these disputes has been the strategy of sustained and escalating action. This was the case certainly in my workplace. My employer weathered on and off strikes for a period of time without making further concessions. That we had a period at the beginning of the dispute where we escalated to all out before the summer term. That was a critical point in pushing them to make um, concessions. Um, but what brought them back to the table after the summer was when we announced that we were going for, to all out strikes throughout the entirety of November. We need to fight to ensure our demands for coordinated struggle and for a general strike are taken up. In February earlier this year, rail workers, school teachers, lecturers, civil servants all took strike action on the same day. This was decisive in pushing the Tories to give more ground and it provides a glimpse of what's possible. Next year we face the prospect of an incoming Labour government, as the Tories are likely booted from power. Prospect of a general election will have a big impact on industrial developments. It's difficult to predict what will happen between now and then, and given how quickly events are developing at the moment, but what's clear is that the previous decade of relative industrial calm has been utterly shattered. We've entered a new situation. The working class is back, yes. We're going to fight the employers, but we're also going to fight the trade union leaders who get in our way. Solidarity. I'm sure if uh, the NEC elections for Unison uh, were now, we would have had a very different result. And I'm sure those workers will remember in two years. Um, so, just a few announcements before I go on some closing remarks for the rally. Um, but first of all, we have uh, the figures from our finance appeal, and so far we've raised 5,295. Now, I want to thank everyone. Because, you know, I mean, this is a lot of <laughs> There is going to be put to a very good use. But also, could everyone please donate £4.33 um, pence so we get to £5,300? <laughs> <laughs> you can, you know, think about it. Um, so, our merry stables are still uh, going to be...
also one extra thing that I wanted to say was um, in Liverpool, like the Merseyside branch is organising a public meeting on Monday um, about you know protesting against gender violence on the 25th of November. Uh, so please, again, if you want to get involved, come and have a chat with me afterwards or um, Ellie, and we can give you all the details. So. Hope everyone has found the event really inspiring. Hope uh, you know you, you want to go back to your workplaces and tell everyone about it, or your schools, or your colleges, uni, wherever you you are. Um, International Socialist Alternative is a revolutionary organization committed to ending the rule of capitalism, the source of exploitation, oppression, war, and environment, environmental destruction in the world today. Our organization was founded to help build a movement that can transform our society into a socialist one that is run democratically by and for working class people. We are proud to be part of an international organization which has, se which has sections in over 30 countries across the world. Um, we have uh, you know, sections from South Africa to China, Hong Kong and Taiwan, the US, Belgium, Ireland, Brazil and many others. So we take part and intervene in the struggles and movements of the working class, young people and the oppressed internationally and put forward our case for building solidarity for working class action and for a socialist alternative to capitalism. So if all of this sounds good to you, if you've enjoyed the event, if you uh, you know, agree with like, all the things that have been said today, please um, join us. You know, we always need more people. We need more people to be able to do this work. Uh, so Please come and talk with one of uh, the socialist members uh, today. Um, and again, thanks everyone for coming. I think this has been a great event and I hope everyone has enjoyed it.